Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Dominic Dom Askey. He has is has written the book My Name is Sharon, which is a bit of a love story between a son and his mother. So thanks for joining me, Dom. Thank you for having me today. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your mom, your caregiving journey, and what led you to write the book? I, I would love to. And I would say, if I want to tell about my mom, she was the most loving, supportive person that I've ever known. And from not just to me, but to cousins that she was sending cards to, to people she worked with. And everybody gave me that same kind of feedback. And unfortunately, my mom was um, went down the path of Alzheimer's and dementia. And why I wrote the book was her dementia collided with 2020, right? And a glow, if she did not have it bad, bad enough, it collided with that global pandemic. And I thought... By day, I am in the publishing business. I help people share their stories. And I thought I owed it to my mom to share her story. It wasn't one that wasn't one that I was able to talk about. So being on a show talking about it is not something I really did. I just wrote and wrote and wrote and didn't really express my feelings verbally. But and that, then I wrote it and there it was. And and that's how it came about. So it's kind of a self-help healing process to write it. Yeah, I would say it was very cathartic. And as I wrote it, I didn't always know how the story was going to end. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And off offline, we were talking that I am working on my own book. I didn't know that Dom was in publishing until we, we have basically spent the previous hour just talking. <laughs> this is not uncommon for me and guests, but um, my Writing journey, I, I'm i looking at it as a cathartic process, and hopefully it's going to be a helpful process with advice for other people. That's the plan once I wrangle my schedule <laughs> into submission so I have more time. But I, tell, us I, about, I, tell us about your mom. <laughs> well, I, and even like your mom as well, I think we have a duty to share these stories. And what I'll say is my mom could no longer share her story. So what I did is I'm just, uh, what would you call that? Uh, a vessel for her to be able to share that story. So what I tried to do is just share a, a message of unconditional love. And I didn't want to just share my mom's story as a victim of disease because I felt that she was so much more than that. So I really wanted to take you back to she's I'm from Pennsylvania. My mom grew up in New Mexico and I wanted to take you back as far as I could to meet her as the, as a young woman in New Mexico. And I researched to find out who she was, interactions she had, friends she talked to so that I could carry that through and tell her whole story because her whole story is more than what happened to her these last 10 years. That's, we're not going to, we've been through that and it's tough, but I am not going to remember that, you know, the bad times. I'm going to choose to remember all, all the good times. And so that's what I, I wanted to put out there. Those, um, the times that she was there for me, the times that she held me, the times that she believed in me when maybe nobody else did and the rest of her family. And like I said earlier, all those other people that she knew and um, helped in various ways. Tell us the story about the restaurant that she helped you with, because there's a correlation between your mom and my mom in that story. So if you tell your part, I'll throw out my part. Okay. So as a young man, I decided to go into the restaurant business. And this was before the mortgage bubble burst or anything like that in the early 2000s. I 
refinanced everything, bought houses to refinance, anything I could to come up with the money that I needed to have a restaurant. And cash flow was tight and things didn't all things don't always work out the way we planned. And mom was always at the restaurant helping, whether it be taking towels home to wash, whether it be seating people helping me with the fryers or anything like that. But what she was best at, which she came to, um, what she came to be best at was she made homemade desserts. She taught herself, she taught herself to make cheesecakes so that I could serve them at my restaurant. And she didn't, She's like she'd come in with key lime pie. She'd come in with Oreo cheesecake, all these cheesecakes that the customers loved. And she did it just out of the kindness of her heart, just so that her son would make, uh, would only lose $10 at the end of the day rather than a hundred because of her desserts drawn in. So that's the story. Well, my mom, my, my sister's four and a half years younger than I, and we grew up with all homemade desserts. Like my best friend in school from fifth grade on to graduation, she'd eat Chips Ahoy. And those things were, I still don't like Chips Ahoy because I've always had homemade desserts. And my mom made great cakes, but they were from a box. But, she, you know, she always decorated them beautifully. And so when I read that part in the book, it, it reminded me, of all the homemade desserts that my mom made, which was she's passed down to me and to my daughter. So that's kind of a nice memory to have. And I've, I've managed to cure my sweet tooth, thankfully, but because we know the sugar is not great for our brains. So that's <laughs> sometimes I miss my sweet tooth because it was such a big part of my life, all these desserts, but that's OK. You might so, have to add the recipe section to that book you're writing. <laughs> well, I have recipes on my website, and many of my listeners and followers know that about a dozen years ago, I went on a weight loss journey because my dad was diabetic, his side of the family, lots of diabetes. I kind of felt like I was, uh, I was ducking the bullet somewhat because all of the people that had diabetes on my dad's side of the family were male, but I had a photography client who was a doctor and we got to chatting about diabetes for whatever reason. And she just looked at me and she said, you have a family history of diabetes. You're overweight. You're screwed. And that is the word she used. And that fired me up because I am a competitive person. And I, my brain said, I'll show you screwed. <laughs> and so it took a lot of effort to find the path that worked, you know, I don't have, I don't ever do things the easy way. I actually had to cut way, way, way back on fat. And that isn't always easy. If you like to eat, <laughs> pretty much is not easy. It's harder than eliminating a lot of the starches, but I did. And I lost a hundred pounds. I've managed to keep most of it off, thankfully, which is a miracle in itself, especially after these caregiving years. And I realized that a lot of what I learned about nutrition really could help people with um, their loved ones that, you know, with Alzheimer's, because as we know, many of them lose the ability to use, you know, knives and forks as the disease progresses. And many of them end up eating with their hands, which we're, we're kind of taught that grownups aren't supposed to do that, but you know, you don't really have a choice when somebody that's all they can do. And so I, I have like, um, protein muffins that taste more like cupcakes. They're kind of a cross between ew, why would I eat this and sugary cupcake? And it's full of protein and they're filling. Cause I know a lot of, a lot of my followers, their, their loved ones just love sugar, which is pretty common with Alzheimer's and the dementias. And so I just, I've curated recipes that are tasty, quick, healthy, and I keep in the back of my head, there's some recipes that have like nuts and stuff in them. I'm like, no, this might not be good for somebody with Alzheimer's because they might choke. Mm -hmm. And so I've curated all these recipes specifically for caregivers who might need an idea or 
They mm-hmm. they want something that looks like you should eat it with your hands, or they need something they could carry with them easily because their loved one's always hungry. So, um, but I have I do have re- I have what is it? Healthier baking and snacking is one of the rest one of the sections on my website mm-hmm. because I did learn between the diabetes and and my weight loss, I learned how to bake differently. So healthier baked goods is my jam. <laughs> I, I think that has to be resources in the back of your book. There you go. Oh, okay. Well, now the book just got longer. So, <laughs> sorry, sorry. When sorry. you when you tell me that this uh, five hundred pound book is too big, I'm going to blame you. So, since we're talking a little bit about nutrition, and you're, you know, I want we'll get back to your book in a second, but having gone through this experience with your mom, what do you think caregivers? that are in the early stages of caregiving, like what is, if you could tell everybody that's the beginning of this journey, like the most important thing in your opinion, what would that be? That it is a disease and how you treat people with it. Think about how you treat somebody with another disease when somebody's sick in another way. So, and this is so prevalent and I see it over and over and over that they, that you have people that want to yell, that want to fight, that want to argue. This person, your loved one is sick. They're hurting. And I really think if you could remember, have that empathy that they're sick. You've been sick, right? And this is this is a different kind of sickness. And uh, really take a second, take a step back before you respond and just have that in the back of your head that, it is a disease. They are sick. They're, they didn't do it on purpose. They're not arguing with you on, on purpose. They're, you know, they're they're mad now. They're angry now. They're sick. Their brain isn't working right right now. Right? Those wires. Who knows what's going on? So that would. That's, I think I'd stick with that one. That's excellent. And actually, nobody's ever answered that way. So that is excellent. It reminds me of my guest, past guest, Helene Berger. She, she was taking care of her husband and he asked a question for the third time and she rolled her eyes and then turned around and answered him. And he saw the frustration on her face. And she, when she turned around, he looked, she said he looked like she'd beat him. And from that day forward, she's like, I'm never going to allow myself to do or say something that will make him feel that bad. And so but when she started getting frustrated with, you know, how they repeat the question because their brain doesn't remember it, that if he could remember, he wouldn't ask. And he did not ask to have Alzheimer's. So that was kind of her mantra of to keep her from rolling. I mean, we all roll our eyes like, oh, dear. You know, like, okay, we're going there again. I mean, it's just it's probably a really bad habit. But it, when you said that, it kind of reminded me of her and feel really bad because I can't remember the name of her book. This is the problem. I'm really bad at names. It has a sunflower on the front that her husband drew. So I'll link that in the show notes when I remember what the name of the book is. <laughs> at least I remembered all the other details. Yeah, it's pretty good. So what other good stories about your mom, Sharon, do you have to share with us? So I'll, I think I'll start you with one that um, starts starts the book. And I, I just to let you know the kind of mother that she was. And that would be that I was probably, we'll say it was the eighties and we're going to a a local store to get some uh, Italian bread. And I I wasn't the, (laughs) I'm Polish, but we were going for Italian bread. That's like this, this flaky bread that you eat with your dinner that you can just grab chunks off and eat by the like a whole loaf at the time, right? You just would hide up in your room eating this. So, and I, I probably was seven, six years old. And I, I, I admit that I was a goofy kid. <laughs> it, it took me many years to grow out of uh, giant teeth and big pot gut. And my mom cut my hair like a beetle. So, um, <laughs> So I'm watching her. <laughs> I go on and on. So I'm watching her go into this local store, and there's some kids out in the, um, riding their 
BMXs in the parking lot, probably teenagers. And I'm just in the car playing with these wrestlers, right? And <laughs> little like Hulk Hogan type rubber wrestlers, you know, she walks in. And this is in the day where you could leave a kid in the car for <laughs> to walk into the store. It's the 80s. Um, probably didn't have a seatbelt either back then. But anyway, I'm watching the kids play and I can see them start to harass me for my looks and those types of things like that. Well, and they just, but my mom's in the store. I'm safe as a young, I'm safe, right? I'm in the door. They're just eh, pointing at me, making fun of me, like that kind of thing, and progressively. But maybe it hurt, but not uh, just that's how it was. And my mom come out and they were a little closer to the car at the time. And my mom scooted them away because she was not a fan of nonsense in any way. Never, especially when she could tell they were probably not being nice to me. Mom was a protector. So as we, as we pull away, you know, the kid, one of the older kids spits in the window on me and runs off on his dirt bike you know, it was a pedal bike, but runs off on his pedal bike, goes that way, goes right. My mom gets in the car, turns the ignition on, backs out as fast as you can, goes left, right? They're a complete different direction. And we go through, we make like a big box of right angles around the neighborhood as fast as you can. She's zooming around the neighborhood. I don't know where she's going. I just know she's not happy. All of a sudden, we get to face to face with that teenager again he's on the road he sees us drops his bike runs off my mom gets out of the car and runs down like she's like i don't know what my mom thinks she's gonna do she's not like tough or anything but she was when it came to defending me and runs down runs through this kid's the group of friends there and they're you know they spread like the red sea or whatever it is and she gets up, she gets, and you see her talking to this kid. And a few minutes later, he walks up to the car, like signals for me to roll down the window a little more. I <laughs> wind them down. That's how it was. And he puts out his hand and he shakes my hand and apologizes. And mom comes back to the car. The kid goes his other way. And she never said another word about it. And my whole life, my mom protected me like that. So I consider it my duty to protect her in whatever way I can, from the homes we pick to how our bills are paid to the food that she eats to the choices that get made to whatever I have to do. And it is all that she protected me like that. And I just hope that I can do her justice and protect her the same way and it, it continued like that my whole life from helping me at a restaurant to helping me with school to whatever to even watching my children when they were a little older yeah. <laughs> my mom doted on my daughter my daughter is mm, 14 years i just wanted to make sure i had the math right 14 years older than the next granddaughter and then my my nephew is younger than his sister so my daughter got all the good years with my mom, which mm -hmm. doesn't make my sister happy, but this is life. So I can relate to that one. Just She just she taught my daughter how to bake. My daughter loved to make the sugar cookies that she had to roll out, cut, decorate. You know, not the simple chocolate chip cookie. That was my mom's favorite. Now, we had to do the hard stuff. But you, you said something that I want to circle back to slightly. You said... You want to make sure that you're doing everything to protect her, including the care home that you chose. How did you guys, it's you and your sister, right? I have to confess, yeah. I've only read part of the book so because my life has been crazy lately. So I yeah. have a sister that I, my dad is around. He still works six days. He still works six days a week. So he's had a business for about 50 years, old school businessman. And my sister is across the country in Dallas. And I'm in Pittsburgh. Okay. So, uh, so the question was, how did we choose? Mm -hmm. So 
it becomes very stressful as your listeners know, or as, as you know, and it, it really became one. I'll go back that my mom fell and they lived, my parents lived in an old farmhouse and we were probably heading this direction for a while that we, we probably should have made a choice sooner to take her out of my parents' house. My dad works six days a week. They live in a farmhouse with steps on steps. The steps have steps, right? <laughs> so every addition has steps and things, trip steps. It just, but she ended up falling and we did, we didn't even know she fell. She was just basically catatonic at home. And we had to um, call 911 to come get her. And at that point, it actually took them days in the hospital to even realize that she had fallen because she really couldn't communicate much. And so it led to, first, it was occupational rehab. And it was from there what home would be willing to take um, somebody with Alzheimer's at my mom's level right? Because she's not able to do a lot of things or communicate all the time. Like sometimes she can, sometimes she can get a sentence out. I look at it as sometimes I get five seconds, right? I might, mo- I don't get five, I might get five seconds in a day. And it's to say, that's not what my mother looked like, or something to that effect. But then I, I don't all, but I'll take that five seconds every time. So any moment of clarity, even though that's not, she doesn't know me or know my fam, you know, but I, sometimes I think, sometimes I think she knows me. Sometimes I see her smile and I think she knows, she knows that person. <laughs> so a lot, so the, we were limited to the places we could choose, but me and my dad live about 15 minutes apart. And we were able to find a place that is about six minutes from me and about 10 minutes from him. So I I really can be there in six minutes and they allow visitors all the time. So sometimes I go twice in one day. Sometimes I go at nine o'clock at night. Sometimes I go at seven in the morning. This was more pre COVID when you could go out now. The, I can still show up when I want, but it, it's more outside visits. And during COVID, it was completely different. And a, a lot of the the book does document like the, what happened during COVID and how we didn't get to see our loved ones as much and the hurt of that. But that all those are how we came up with uh, um, where where she's living. And they're doing a. They've done a spectacular job. They, they, I feel like, I feel that they love her. I can fully understand that. For new listeners and for yourself, we had a plan for when my dad was on hospice, my sister and I, who agree on nothing, period. Like, nothing. I'm not even sure we would agree that we agree on nothing. That's how bad it is. We had a plan, and our aunt had taken care of my grandmother, her mom, who had vascular dementia, and I've never never understood how this our family ended up on this path, but my aunt ended up living on Grandma's Social Security. Okay, seemed fair. You know, she was doing all the heavy lifting, except for the fact that my grandmother died and my aunt had nothing. So my aunt is on welfare assist, you know, um, housing assistance. And my sister and I felt that we could move her into mom and dad's house. She could pretty much manage the care. We would still bring in a caregiver for, so that my aunt didn't have to do all the heavy lifting. My aunt's like 11 years younger than mom. So, you know, she's not young, but she's not old either. But I, went into the deep dark recesses of negativity which is not hard not hard for me to do and i thought now what if and i list thought of some negative scenarios how would i feel about them how would i handle them what would we do and i came to the conclusion this is not a good solution anymore so i went and looked for a memory care residence and at the time there was one literally a mile down the hill from my house 
and I knew it wasn't a great place. My husband went and looked at it. He came home. He looked like he'd just come back from the morgue or he'd seen a ghost. He's like, I would never put anybody's parents there. Not quite sure they were that bad, but they weren't, they weren't on the top of the list, even though, I mean, ridiculously close. I would have had to work hard not to go see her. So I started looking around, did not mention to my sister that I had leaped off the one page of agreement that we were on and found this one place, talked to them, and I offhand made the comment, I'm just going to have to figure out what to do with her dog. Unfortunately, my dogs don't like her dog, and that's so she can't come live with me. And they looked at me and they said, oh, we could probably work something out. And I literally like flung open my purse. I'm like, how much do you want as a deposit? I was just like, here's money. Take it away. I like, and then I, afterwards in talking to people like yourself, I realized I did no Google searching, no vetting, did not talk to anybody, did not look at any reviews, nothing. It was all gut instinct. Mm-hmm. And thankfully my gut was good because they were also super wonderful. They put out at the, the last year of my mom's life, she was, she get, would get frustrated and she would literally claw people and they and I was so embarrassed because like my mom would never do something like yeah. that. That was totally she might. I don't want to say bitch you out, but that's the only term that's coming to mind. <laughs> that's she might do that, but she would never physically harm somebody. And so it was just it was it was really hard to handle. And they're like, oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm like, no, it's not fine. And so they were just wonderful for her. And, you know, but you made a point that I like to stress. You said you probably waited too long and I am notorious. If somebody online on Instagram or Facebook says, ask the question, when do you know it's time for memory care? And my pat answer is if you're asking it's past time, (laughs) I'm very blunt about that answer. So I'm assuming you kind of feel the same way. Yeah. And it's such a hard conversation. It would be great. (laughs) One of the things that, people have told me since reading the book is that they started planning what they would do, what their, he, one of the gentlemen said, I had to have a a talk with my wife about what we were going to do. And that was not something I ever intended, right? Because those plans were never made and my parents didn't have those kind of plans. It just, it happened. And so I don't know how you have that conversation prior with somebody that it's it's one of those things where i say if you love somebody and you make a decision out of love with their best interest in mind then you did a pretty good job so there are times as a parent i have two children right where it would be easier to do to not correct my children to let them do something destructive to let them but learn on their own. But as a dad, I have to try to give them values and lessons that when they're 18, 21, that makes them a good person, that they can be a productive member of society. So sometimes you have to make the harder right. And that's what I would say in that case to anybody wondering about, should I put mom, dad, and a home loved one, make the harder right? Well, you know, you, that person already knows, right? What should you do? Well, fight like hell and figure it out, right? Because it's not going to get easier. It's gonna, it's going to get worse. And I had the guilt because maybe I waited too long. Maybe my mom would have never fell. Maybe I would have saved her from embarrassing situations. Maybe, maybe I could have just been more loving had I, maybe had I done, had I made the hardy right. <laughs> If you carry yesterday, you have no time for today. When we stop learning, we start dying. Keep your mind sharp. Pursue knowledge for its own sake. My father did not know the difference between boys and girls. There was no double standard ever. Hi, I'm Erin Davis. Elder Wisdom, Stories from the Green Bench, began as a way for seniors, including residents at Schlegel Village's long-term care and retirement homes, to share their stories and wisdom. 
This podcast is a loving extension of that. It's a virtual place to share, learn, grow, laugh, and yeah, sometimes shed a tear or two. In the words of Ron Schlegel, the greatest untapped resource in Canada, if not the world, is the collective wisdom of our elders. So join us as we speak with and listen to seniors and those working in senior care. Subscribe to our podcast today. And remember, your seat on the green bench is ready and waiting. Well, I can I can tell you this is this is how I soften my if you're asking the question, it's to it's pastime blunt answer is you know, a lot of people have a misconception of the potentials of a memory care community. My mom had friends, and my listeners know my mom's name was Diane. She befriended a Diane, and they befriended a third Diane. You want to talk about confusing? Try talking to people with Alzheimer's that all have the same name. <laughs> Nobody knows who's talking about who. It's just, it was like, <laughs> so we, in, in our conversations, it was always mom, other Diane, and other, other Diane. <laughs> and it was just crazy. But had, sh- she moved into my house as my dad, I found out after he died, that was his plan without discussing it with me. We would have had to hire a caregiver so that my husband and I could continue working because I was 50 at the time. And my daughter had just moved out the month before. And we were very much looking forward to like, oh, freedoms. Like our biggest responsibility besides ourselves is the two dogs. I think there was two at the time. We lost one. Yeah, there was still two. Then there was three. Now we're back down to two. (laughs) It's crazy. My mom, in addition to having friends, she also did activities there that she refused to do with me. I never understood that. Still baffles me. I'll never find that answer. But that, you know, there was things that she she had friends that she wouldn't have had living with me. She did activities that she wouldn't do with me. So it was definitely a good quality of life for her. Is it what she wanted? No. The day before we moved her in, I went to her house. My hair person is in mom's town, the town mom that I grew up in. And I stopped off at mom's house to talk to the caregiver. And the plan was for her when her shift was over to bring her to the salon and with the dog and mom's overnight bag. And I would then take her home to my house. And the next morning we'd take her to the care home. My mom was leaning on the kitchen counter, looking out the, to the backyard that a a nice view of a, of a mountain that we live at the base of. And our excuse was we need to move you out temporarily because there's some things we need to fix in this house, which was true. The temporary part wasn't true. So she's leaning on the counter and she goes, well, you're not going to sell my house. I'm like, Oh no, no, we're not, we're not selling your house. Oh yes. You want to talk about a moment of clarity? She whips her head over and looks at me and she goes, you're not renting it out either. And I'm like, "Mm, yes, we are. Oh, pain, agony. So I drive to this hair salon, right? Pull into the turn lane that had curbs on both sides, sliced both tires on my 18-month-old car on the right side. (laughs) And then I had to call a tow truck, and then I had to go to the tire place with my mom and the dog. It was just, like, not fun. That's a good thing, right? Yeah, that... That was, that was, that was up there about a one out of 10, you know, and thankfully, you know, my hair gal got everything that she needed to get done except dry it. You know, and this was March. So, you know, you don't really want to run around with wet hair. I would prefer not to run around in public with wet hair, but that was my only option. And we had to go to the tire place and they're putting on the tires and you know, the, um, was that the air rent with a brrrt where they put on the lug nuts Every time that noise happened, my mom jumped and then she'd complain. So, you know, it wasn't like I was already stressed out and upset enough. So, and then the next day was even worse because you would have thought that we had left my mom in prison. She begged and pleaded not to get, leave there. What are we, why are you doing this to me? And then she basically clung to the dog and acted like my sister and I were dead to her. So yeah, it was real fun. So waiting too long is not a good idea because it's not easy and it will never get easy but springing on them like that is at when they're 
already later in the stages and they don't understand what's going on and why it's the right choice is just, yeah, it was not, not how I recommend doing it, but I can answer the question of how you have this conversation and it should be easier for people like you and I, I know we've done it. I only have one daughter. She will be 30 in November. This is September 23rd. And my husband is an only child. So it's like, there's just the, there's just the four of us. My daughter's got, she'll be getting married next year. Yay. So there's just the four of us and the dogs and their cat. And having to clean out my parents' house, they, they weren't hoarders, but they'd lived there for almost 47 years. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like, how much is this, you know, like I literally took home, like just a c- couple things, no, no big deal. And then when we sold our house last year, we got rid of so much stuff. And then it was so free. And it's like, wow, I didn't realize this stuff was weighing me down, but it, it did. So last summer, so this was 2020, my husband and I are like, we really, really should get our estate planning done. Cause you know, we're like getting to our mid fifties here. It's kind of late in the game, which unfortunately I found out that we were not late to the party. Most people don't do it soon enough. And we had lots of conversations with the lawyer and the estate planning about what if, you know, the what if conversations. And I have been a huge advocate for Gen Xers like ourselves. I'm assuming you're a Gen Xer to rethink assisted living. So you get to 80, 85 years old. Maybe you've been retired for 10 or 15 years. Why would you not want to move into a place where somebody is taking care of the yard and the building and they're cooking you nice food and there's activities that somebody plans and there's people right there that you can socialize with or not. And there's somebody to make sure that if you fall, you're not laying there for two or three days like my husband's grandmother did. You know, it's like, why would you not want to do that? So I have had that conversation with so many people. And and this is a new scenario to my listeners is that we are house hunting and we have found a place that has a very rich social life. It's not assisted living. It's a community. It's like a retirement community, but it's not age restricted. So it's a development on a lake that has boating and you know, they do golf cart parades at thanks, not Thanksgiving, 4th of July and Christmas. You know, there's golfing, dancing, craft club, pinochle, whatever. I mean, there's so many activities. I think we might be exhausted if we, we'd have to work hard not to have a good social life. And one of the reasons we picked this place is specifically because you have a community of people to do things with. You get to know them. And if something happens to you, you've kind of got a built-in community support. But as we're house hunting, he tells the broker that we're working with, this will be our last house unless or until we have to move into assisted living. And I swear the day he told the broker that, I was like, yay, I've succeeded with at least one person. So we just really need to rethink it. It's like assisted living is not some sort of punishment for getting to 85 or whatever. It's not a place where you go and sit in a chair and wait to die because they got a lot of stuff going on there. Where my mom lived, the assisted living was across the street from a middle school and they would have kids come in and the kids would do all kinds of different things. Crafts with the older people, baking. um, I don't know. They just did all kinds of things. And the memory care residents that were able to participate in some way in those activities, they would bring them over. So it's like, it was a very rich life. So we just really need to rethink it. And when we rethink what assisted living slash memory care can be or should be, it's very easy to have that conversation because now you're excited. You're like, yeah, please. I I don't want to deal with mowing the lawn at 85. Uh, I really like your um, perspective on that because if you think about maybe sometimes people think that they are losing, giving up control. But really, if you position it as you're positioning it, you're gaining control. You're making a choice now that somebody's going to have to make for you later. And you may not like the choice they, you may, you may not like the choice that they choose, but here you still have control to 
like you said, you could pick a place where you could go golfing and has activities and a, a lake or whatever they have, right? They're going to cook yeah. the dinner. It's not so yeah. bad. Yeah. And, and, you know, I I wish, and I, I'm assuming this will happen. It probably won't happen in my lifetime, although my paternal grandmother lived to be 103, so there's a few more years left for me. <laughs> I tell people I'm around for at least another 45 years. I really think that they need to rethink assisted living and so that they have like little cottages, like maybe little two bedroom cottages that are on the grounds of the, the buildings that have all the apartments in it. Because, you know, if you're fine, you don't need walking aids or you don't need somebody to physically help you with certain things you you need you want some independence, but you also want somebody else to take care of all the hard stuff. That's a really good option. I think my paternal grandmother would have been more interested in that option. And this is one of the reasons that I advocate so strongly for rethinking what our end years should be like. Like, why would you, like, you're 85, 90 years old. Why the hell do you want to make bread? Why do you want to cook three meals a day? Why do you want to be responsible? Exactly. I mean, even if it's the two of you, you know, if you're lucky enough to have, or one lucky, it depends on how you look at it, your spouse for, you know, 60, 70 years, dear Lord, we've been married 32, so 70 is definitely possible. (laughs) And, you know, why, like, after a while, it's like, my husband makes the same breakfast, and it's like, when he starts getting sick of them and we have to like make a shift, it's like, oh, thank God, because I'm so sick of this when I could scream. And, you know, it's like, why, why would you not want to give that up? I mean, you've worked hard. You, you've, you've done your career. Most of us have raised a family or helped, ra- you know, other people's family, whatever. We've all, we've all put in the hard work. Why the hell do we want to keep doing that in our 80s and 90s? No, thank you. I'll let somebody else take care of all that stuff. <laughs> That's my theory. But my paternal grandmother was mostly blind from glaucoma. My dad's younger brother, the middle brother, and his wife lived pretty close by. And my aunt basically gave up 25 years of her life to bringing Nana food and taking her to the doctor, taking her to the hair place and going grocery shopping with her and blah, 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 blah. And this may offend some people, but when my grandmother ended up in a board and care home because she'd had some mild strokes... And the end was obviously coming. I mean, at 103, (laughs) kind of wondering if the end is ever coming. I really assumed that when my grandmother wouldn't be gone 24 hours and my aunt and uncle would move to Idaho to be with their two daughters and their four granddaughters. And when my aunt told me that my uncle was not healthy enough, my uncle also has diabetes, had a kidney transplant like my dad, and has residual issues because of this, that he's not healthy enough for them to move to their daughters and granddaughters. I was like, oh, this makes me so angry because my aunt devoted so much time to my grandmother and now she doesn't she doesn't get to reap the benefits of, okay, now I don't have to worry about anybody but the two of us. Let's move by the, by the girls and the grand, you know, it's like all six grandkids and the one son-in-law. <laughs> it's like all six daughter or females and the one guy. So it's just, you know, it's like people say, I don't want to be a burden, but I want to live in my home forever. Please rethink that. And for those of you that are doing the caregiving or like me have just finished with the caregiving, ask yourself if you want to do that to your loved one. Do you want your kids to have to go through what you've gone through? Oh, no. Okay. Make plans. That's my speech. Thank you. So do you have like another really good story that well, because now I'm like, okay, you've told some stories. I'm like, okay, I got to finish the book now on top of everything else I'm doing. (laughs) So what other little juicy tidbit can you tell us so that other people are going to want to get your book? All right. Let me, if I want to go down a path, I just want to position people to, to know that my mom's Alzheimer's collided with 2020 with COVID-19. What does that mean? Well, that means that she fell in January of 2020. We knew, we did not know the world was going to go into change. 
So <laughs> prior to March, we were there every day. Sometimes I'd run into my dad every day. At, like I'd run into my dad. I'd be leaving. He'd be coming. He'd be sitting there eating. We'd be there. That's how close we were to they'd be like, oh, you, your dad was just here. And, right. So then you started to hear about this virus. And we know now <laughs> what that means. Then yeah. then we, we didn't really know what was coming. So March hits and you start. It's, is it, it's getting closer. It's getting closer. You, my neighbor had it. My neighbor's in the hospital early on in 2020. In my area, I knew people that were, whether wherever you stand on it, people in my area, my neighbor was in the hospital on a ventilator. So it became very real, very quick. And all of a sudden, there's a sign on the door that says no one under 18 can come in on a day. My dad was picking my son up at boxing and was going to meet us, meet me there actually that night. Then the next day, the sign, we get a call that says no one can come anymore. And that was in March. So the journey that I want to tell you about was what happens then. Here I made these choices, and this this case screw up our whole conversation. I made these choices that led to my mom being in this care home, and now this pandemic hits, and it's my fault, right? I I can't even get in and see her. Now is she safe there? Conceivably, maybe she's safer because she's not falling down the steps. Maybe because it's they're making sure she eats three times a day and takes her vitamins, takes her boost, that kind of thing. But this this guilt that not only I had, but my family had, my sister, that we all put her and we can't even see. And it took it took a lot of time before we understood FaceTime. My mom's not able to, you know, they'd have to put it to her phone. And even at that and then it just went on and on and became crueler and crueler and crueler. And those taking a, maybe my daughter was 10 at the time and 11, right? Taking a, a daughter to a window visit, right? And what that means is you're looking in at a woman who doesn't know you through a screen, and maybe I shouldn't have, when I talk about the, the guilt that just, maybe I shouldn't have put my young daughter in a position I can't handle. I can't handle this a year later telling you about it right now. And what kind of parent was I to put my daughter in, in, in that position? So these are the, I tell you this because the story is just, unconditional love and it's what we were all going through and that's kind of i didn't i didn't expect when i wrote a story about um my mom's alzheimer's i didn't think that that's how it was going to end so i just started writing and i couldn't finish the story because the story didn't end right it was there <laughs> there it was i mean we we talked about we're still in some stages of this whatever's going on in the world, we're still being affected by it. So this that's on the, um, on the forefront of so many minds, this is what we all had to go through as a, as a country, as people, as a world, you know, and then combine it with something that we can't handle. That's too much for anybody, anybody, you out there. Here's what I would say to your listeners. You are not alone. You have people like Jennifer, you have people like me, you, this community is what I've learned is it's so much bigger and more supportive than I ever knew. So don't think that guilt that you're feeling me and Jennifer felt it too. your friend that had a grandmother, they feel it too. So just talk about it and know that there's other people out there that um, are there for you. And that's how I will wrap up that long winded story. No, that's a good one. And 
if there's any silver lining to this insanity that we've lived through for like a year and a half is we've 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 shown a very bright spotlight on things that are like oh yeah locking everybody up and not letting people visit that wasn't good but this disease continually spreading that wasn't good so i i think we need to advocate for conversations on okay well we managed to get through that for better or worse however we've managed how can we do better if when this happens again my mom's care home had a huge flu outbreak normal flu i guess i might have to say now in 2018 so they basically had you know red printed signs on the door that warned you of this problem suggested you not come in but didn't prevent you from not coming in her home was the same as yours we could go 24 7 any hour of the day didn't have to call or you know so that was that was also <laughs> thankfully my gut instinct was good on that one too and my mom went back from the hospital march 12th i think i told you she broke her leg so i, I was dealing with like do i want my mom in a hospital like uh, this I thought this was a China thing, and now it appears to, like, not just be in China, and do I want her here? Do I want to be here? So I went through all of those questions. She went back to the care home March 12th. I saw her March 12th. I saw her March 14th. March 14th, the protocol to get in was different than March 12th. I saw her on March 16th, and I had to go through the front of the assisted living. I had to sign in. I had to fill out paperwork. I had to have my temperature checked. I mean, every other day, the protocols got more strict and a little more irritating. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out, like, what the hell is going on here? And March 17th, boom, no more visits. And my mom died March 31st. So I did not see her for the last two weeks of her life, but... They called me on March 29th, one of the caregivers I was really close to, and they said, Mom's not doing really good. We think she'd be do she'd it might help if you came and saw her. Which I realize is translation for holy holy crap, this woman's about to die. We better let the family in. <laughs> and so I went and saw her the next morning, and it was really obvious to me that I had thought my mom and I always went to the park or wherever to watch kids. And I was actually more than okay with her being wheelchair bound because she walked so slowly and she always had to walk like 15 feet behind me, which always made me nervous because, you know, stuff happens. We all trip and miss things. And I was just always worried that she would fall or something would happen on my watch because she would not walk with, with me. If I slowed down, she slowed down. It was, it was like a comedy of nonsense. So I was fine with it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've learned from Tipa Snow how to transfer people in and out of the car and into it in and out of the wheel. Great. I'll I'll practice with like my husband who's a foot taller than me. This will be this is gonna be okay. And I'll be able to get her from point A to point B in a reasonable amount of time. This this'll be great. So I was like actually really positive about it. And when I saw her on the 30th, I was like, yeah, we're not gonna be doing that. And I've had dogs all my life, so I recognized the signs. The next day I talked to the hospice nurse there. She said, you know, yeah, she kind of agreed with the, with my assessment from the day before I did a podcast recording. I was having lunch and the care home called and they said, please come now. And we didn't get there in time and I have to give them credit. And this is, I'm not even, sh I'm not going to tell you guys which company they're with. Cause I'm uh, the assist. The executive director has changed companies, so he's not going to get in trouble. But my husband and I and my daughter and almost son-in-law showed up together. My sister and her family, so another four people, were less than 10 minutes behind me. Her youngest brother and her sister, my mom's brother and sister, she's got one that's three hours away, they were about 10 minutes behind my sister. So my mom has passed away. And there are 10 people in the hallway of the care home, the very height of the beginning of the pandemic. And that poor executive director, I'm sure we gave him some serious gray hair because he was so kind. He did not tell us to please get the hell out and go into the parking lot. 
He did not say it, but he did communicate it. And I, I laugh because, I mean, it's just the whole thing was just nobody knew how to handle it. So now we know these things can happen, hopefully not like this again, but there is going to be flu outbreaks. The flu outbreak they had in 2018 was so bad on the assisted living site, they had to close the dining room and serve all the residents their meals in their rooms, which is what they did during COVID. So they had kind of a trial run, for better or worse. And, you know, now it's like, okay, what do we do if there's some sort of really big problem? Like, God forbid we do this again, please no. You know, now we've got some information. So instead of just saying, oh, thank God that's behind us, that's not going to happen again. That, that That's that's where I'd like to go. But let's have conversations about what if. Because I know people that pulled loved ones out of care homes. And I don't think they were prepared. There were people that are like, oh my God, I can't deal with this anymore. And put their family in. I mean, it's just... COVID made chaos out of this whole thing. It's already chaotic enough. So my theory is plan ahead. Have conversations. You know... If you if if the time has come to start looking for a care home, ask these questions. What do you do if there's a big flu outbreak? You know, how did you guys handle COVID? You know, did you like throw up the tanks around the place and not let any family members near the building? Or did you do the window visits or, you know, like ask these questions because, you know, information is power. And that's why I have these conversations with people like you. Oh, well, thank you. And you're doing a good job with it. So thank I you appreciate very much. it. So the link for your book, My Name is Sharon, is going to be in the show notes, is in the show notes. And is there any place on the internet people can find you if they want to, I don't know, interact with you online like we do these days? Sure. And my whole world revolves around sharing inspiration, positivity, and smiles 24-7. So if you look up Motivation Champs anywhere in some capacity – we will be sharing inspiration. It could be a Jennifer's story. It could be somebody else's story. It could be a beautiful sunset that somebody sees that day. But every day we share inspiration. So, the, and that's Motivation Champs. And if you look it up anywhere, connect, send me a, send me a message, love to chat and uh, I'll follow you. Terrific. Well, I appreciate it. And I probably have a zillion sunset photos for you. Or if you want fuzzy dog pictures, I got a lot of those too. <laughs> Whatever makes people smile, right? Inspiration is different for everybody. For some people, it's a walk in the woods. For some people, it's going to the gym. For some people, it's reading a book. So we try to share it in every capacity that we can. Wonderful. Well, that will also be linked in the show notes so people can easily find you. I gratefully appreciate these two hours of chatting, only one of which we recorded because... My guests and I have a tendency to be chatty people because you wouldn't be a podcaster without that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.